I'd like to do is go back to John 10, 10. Because in John 10, 10, is where we sort of launch on this thing. And we see what Jesus had to say about our enemy. Uh, anybody notice the work of the enemy today anywhere? <laughs> well, let me tell you. <laughs> He's on your job site. Wait a minute, that's Paradise Valley. He's not supposed to be in Paradise. Oh, Paradise Valley he is. Huh? <laughs> he was on the job site. He gets around. He? That's right. Uh, but John 10, 10, Jesus is warning us about the reality of what life is like in this world. And, uh, and what he says in John 10, 10, Jesus has identified himself as the good shepherd. And, uh, and it's interesting that he says he's the door. And that the sheep are going to come and go and find pasture. Uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? They're going to enter through him. But he said, all those who came before me were thieves and robbers. That's verse 8 of John chapter 10. And uh, he says, but the sheep didn't hear him. And I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. And then in verse 10 he says, the thief comes only. And he says to do three things. Steal. Kill and destroy. Now, we've discussed and concluded that the primary target for this thief doing his destructive work and killing, um, his primary target's not your car, your cell phone, your computer, your jewelry. Uh, that's right. Your debit card. Uh, or the bank account where, where Kim works. <laughs> Somebody... Uh, is tumbling in trying to get some finances there where she uh, does bookkeeping. Uh, the target is stealing the Word of God out of our earth. I wonder, I wonder how many people on the day that Jesus uh, passed through Jericho, people were too busy. And working in the garden, did a little house cleaning. Well, I got a chance to close this business deal and Jesus passed through and they couldn't bother to stop by there. How many times... He walked through his own hometown. Oh, he's the hometown kid. There, you know, can't be. It can't be anything very significant. Uh, and uh, and you know, uh, you know who an expert is. Uh, he's someone who's from more than 25 miles away. <laughs> That's what I, I told the folks in Minnesota. I said, you know, you know, I'm an expert because I came on an airplane. So. Uh, but Jesus said, you know, a prophet's not without honor except in his in his in his own town among his among his family and so forth. And, uh, and yet, folks, we have opportunity after opportunity to witness the move and the work of God. The thing that blows my mind is when we see as many miraculous things as we have seen God do, uh, how people look at it and see it, and it doesn't shift their mindset about what's really priority in their lives, you know? Uh, and... Uh, and you know, I'm not one, I really don't believe my job is to talk about people who are not present, okay? So I'm not going to pursue that any further. I've always believed that God called me to speak and because God has something to share with every one of us wherever we are. Uh, Nathan and our other three sons, we were, we were invited to a church where uh, I had pastored the summer. Lynn and I were married back in 1974 in Uray, Colorado, and, and we went over uh, we went over to the church there, and the pastor got up. They, everybody in the church has been in the church 20, 25 years. It's a Sunday night service, not a visitor, no, nobody that they, they're not familiar with. And he got up and he preached the salvation message that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to forgive you every sin. Which is true. Absolute truth. And then he gave an invitation. And isn't it stunning? No one responded to come get saved. <laughs> You know, I want to say, Pastor, buy a vowel here, you know? <laughs> Get a clue. Are, are you really thinking that God has nothing to say to these people? Oh, well, they got their ticket punch, so they're all they're all just fine. You know, when I when I first started sharing it at Queen Valley, there there was a little criticism because, you know, well, doesn't Rick ever preach about Jesus? It's what was said to someone and it was passed along to me. And I wanted to pull out what hair remains. <laughs> Don't you get it? This entire book is about Jesus Christ. Everything in here is about Jesus. It starts from Genesis 1 and He's there. And the whole thing is all about Jesus 
in a relationship with Him. And so when we're studying the prophets, it's about Jesus. When we study about the enemy, it's about Jesus. It's about His kingdom, about what He's having. But you see, what they really wanted was a lot more comfortable. Somebody get up and preach that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And isn't that wonderful that God loves us and died on the cross for our sins? Let's don't talk about the enemy. Let's don't talk about us dying to our flesh. Don't let us talk about, the Scripture says, prove yourself to be His disciple. Let's don't talk about any of those things. Uh, you know, we, we're not comfortable with those things. So, um, anyway, God is always, has something to say to us. But it's amazing how we as humans are very much like sheep. Have you seen the, the videos or maybe you've seen in real life where someone has a corral with sheep in it and it's one of those you slide the rails out uh, because there's not an actual gate so that's what they use is the gate. And the first sheep when the rails are moved jumps over. And they get the others out and they can walk right through and guess what they do? <laughs> There's nothing there, but hey, the guy out of there jumping, so I'm jumping too. And it's, it's amazing how often we find ourselves just like that. And so the, the, one of the schemes of the enemy uh, is to keep us busy on a treadmill doing the same things we've done before. And, uh, you know, pay no attention to us. Or as that one unclean spirit said, one of the rare occasions where uh, I had one speaking out of a person said, we're not in here. When we're telling him to get out of this man, he's saying, we're not in your hands. So, the enemy wants to do that, but, but focus, remember his focus, focus of his attention is not on your stuff. Now, he may do that just to torment you and harass you, but his focus is the scripture. That's what he wants to steal and kill and destroy, is in the soil of your heart. 1 Corinthians 3 9 says, where God's field. And the seed of the word is implanted here. Uh, and you remember now in the parables of Jesus. Well, let's just go ahead and look at Matthew 13. Jesus speaking to the largest crowd he ever addressed in Matthew 13. He, verse 3, spoke by uh, many things to him in parables, saying, The sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road. The birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil and immediately sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root or depth to them, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up, choked them out. Others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop. Uh, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he simply says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The thing that we notice. That is not a coincidence. Is John 10, 10 is explained to us right here in what Jesus says right here. The birds of the air come and steal. The thief comes to steal. The second one, the person listened and liked the idea about Jesus. And man, this sounds pretty good. And they liked the idea of Jesus coming as Savior and being, uh, you know, being born in the in the manger and everything, and but then when tribulation distress comes, then they turn away, and and the word, the seed that was beginning to produce the life of Jesus in them is killed, and then the third kind, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, given priority to other things besides a relationship with God, it gets bigger and bigger, and it chokes out and destroys the word of God. That is the enemy's focus. He doesn't mind you going to church and church ceremonies. He doesn't mind you taking communion. He doesn't object too much when you get baptized. He doesn't, he doesn't object a whole lot when uh, you go and you experience maybe one of the gifts. But He doesn't want you to stay in God's work. He wants to steal that away. And, and that's, that's His primary focus because life for us is in the Word of God. Now, I want to just mention again, and we need to investigate this in some depth. The Word of God is not actually what's printed on these pages, okay? What we have on these pages is the record of the Word of God. Jesus Christ Himself is the Word of God. Amen. Think about it. We, we talked today about staying in the Word, and generally we're referring to continue to read Scripture. Well, there's an element of truth to that. But how were they in the Word before Gutenberg invented his press and then they refined it down to where we could have a Bible that we could carve around? What did they do for the thousands of years before that? How could they be in the Word? 
Because being in the Word is being in tune with God and your mind on God and on the things of God and the, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, previously known as Messiah or, and in some places, the angel of the Lord. Um, and now, of course, known as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Christ. And so, <clears throat> that is the Word is Jesus. It's a spiritual experience. It's not what's written on the pages. And that's why I know people that read the Bible through every year. They don't believe in the powers of darkness. They don't believe that Satan is our real enemy and he can't be near us. There, you know, there might have been a few snuck in on the east or west coast, but most of them are down in South America, Africa, somewhere. They wouldn't be bothering us. You know, maybe a few of them live uh, live to the east of Highway 79 in Florence, okay, over there. But none of them made it over by the windmill. You know, because we're on the west side over here. So, but see. It's amazing how you can have scriptural knowledge and not be in the Word and your heart not be turned to the Lord. So, folks, what we're talking about is something that you can't walk up and go, oh, yeah, oh I see your little, yeah, yeah. You got, you got your trophy there that God gave you. It's on your shoulder. I know you're one of us. No, no. That's why Jesus said the way you're going to identify His people is by the fruit that comes out of their life, by the fruit that they bear. Now, be careful because religious leaders, they want to hijack that and say, yes, and your fruit is that you bring more people to our church and get more dollars in the offering plate and, and come and help us in our building project and go on a missions trip and teach a class and do all these things. That's how you bear the fruit. That's not the fruit that the Bible talks about. The fruit the Bible talks about is spiritual in nature and can be seen not in attendance and ceremonies or even in Bible studies. It can be seen in our relationship with our fellow man and material things and, and, and all, that's, all that is about us. Yes, sir, Jerry? Your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks more than your talk talks. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Your walk talks. I can't say it. That's pretty good. Your talk talks. Your walk talks. And your talk talks. Talk talks. But your walk talks, talks more. Then you talk, 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 talk. <laughs> I learned that in old simpler form. It said, what you do speak so loudly, I can't hear what you say. Exactly. It's a, and that's what, that's what Jesus was saying. It's, it's the fruit, the fruit of our life. And so, as the thief focuses on stealing the Word of God, killing it if it starts to take root, or choking it out, trying to dissuade us from continuing in our walk with God, um, we see illustrations of the kinds of things that he brings against us in order to do that. Now, last week we looked at uh, we looked at Zechariah, we looked in First uh, John, and we were seeing these four different instruments the enemy uses against us. We went over to Kings and saw the story in uh, in First Kings. Then we went to Chronicles and we read about King Asa. Remember, it was so great because Second Chronicles is listed for you there. We're not going to go there right now. Uh, actually, if you want to head, let's head over to the book of Ephesians. But in 2 Chronicles, remember it says that Azariah, the son of Odin, went out to meet the king Asa, and he said, the Lord's with you when you're with him. Yeah. Remember? It's like, no, 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 we're God's people. we got a sign out for him. we got a cross on our, uh, we got a steeple and a cross and a sign that says, church, God's always with us. No, he's not. The Lord's with you when you are with him, and if you seek him, he'll let you find him. And then he went on to say that for many days Israel had been without the real God. They were still having worship. They were still observing peace. They were still doing their ceremonies. They were still bringing in their tithes. They were still giving alms. They were still fasting. They were doing all the religious things outwardly, but it wasn't the true God. It was a substitute. It was a God of their own making. And folks, I just tell you, that's what we have in America today. Because we have, we have gods who... The God of America is the big Santa Claus in the sky. He's almost like your cosmic genie, you know? You go down to the church, and if you rub the offering plate, poof, he comes up. Can I do for you today? You have three wishes today. That's, that is, it's not, it's not that great of an exaggeration when I say that, because that's what people's image is. is and you know what prayer is? It's wishing and hoping. And isn't there a song about that? Wishing and hoping. And, no, no. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Can't sing it. But anyway. Uh, but see, that's not what prayer is to be. Prayer is our cry before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Crying out to Him. 
And, uh, and that is the process by which we tap into his resources. But we saw that, that Asa, when they all began to seek the Lord, God's blessings began to be poured out on them. And that's what Second Chronicles is about. But then they went too far. We looked at that scripture. It says, anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ doesn't belong to him. And you see, God said, whosoever will may come. And Asa and the people of Israel said, no, no, we're going to make a law. Anyone that won't seek the Lord with all his heart will be put to death, whether great or small. See, they think they can improve on what God said. That's not what God wants. But that's what they want to do, so God lets them go. And then it comes right back around when King Asa gets fearful because he was in the southern kingdom about the northern kingdom and he goes and makes a, he makes a treaty with the, the king of Damascus without asking God. God has told the kings, you do not make a treaty with foreign power without checking with me. But because he was afraid, he did that. And so the prophet sent to him and says, because you did this, you relied on the king of Aram instead of relying on God. From now on, you're going to have wars. And Asa gets mad at him. Throws him in jail. And uh, and then a couple of, about a year, uh, two years later, he gets disease in his feet. He's still angry about it. And the scripture is, that's listed for you there in 2 Chronicles 16 tells us that uh, even though his disease was severe, he didn't seek the Lord, but the doctors. And so... Two years, two years of that battle with the problem in his feet, and he died. And I know that I know, based on Scripture, had he repented and said, yes, God, I'm wrong, forgive me, then God would have healed him because that's exactly what God did for Hezekiah. He sends Isaiah in, and Isaiah says, God told me to tell you, you're going to die from this, get your house in order. And Hezekiah repents, he turns his face to the wall, he humbles himself, he cries out to God. And God stops Isaiah and sends him back and says, you get, I'll tell him I'll give him 15 more years. See, if God did that for Hezekiah, he also would have done that for Asa if Asa had repented. But he wouldn't. So by the way, the edict and the burden that he put on other people, if you won't seek the Lord with all your heart, you'll be put to death, whether great or small. Came back on his own head. See, here's what the scripture says: Whosoever will may come. They're trying to conscript people into serving God. And God says, no. God very, very <laughs> cautiously guards human freedom, freedom of choice and free will. And we see that all through the scripture. By the way, that's why most of the time in the world, that pot, yeah. you can imagine it up here. <laughs> We can get we can get we can get the big we can get the big barrel again. I won't brag over. That's why most of the time in this world, God's will is not done in most people's lives. And you know, I know in church all of my folks told, "Well, God's will is always going to be done." No, it isn't. Not on a personal level. Now, God's will is going to be done with planet Earth and human creatures and His kingdom. The question is. Are you going to be in on it? Or are you going to get overrun by it? Okay? It's up to you. But God's will is going to be done. Yes, is that the first time that Asa uh, did not do that? Pardon me? Is that the first time that Asa messed up? It, you know, it's interesting. When you read the whole story, we didn't read all of it last week, that it says that he was devoted to the Lord his whole life. But this was this is a reminder once again. The Bible says there's a stricter judgment on the teachers and the leaders. This is part of that stricter judgment. And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing with, uh, with King David. Even though God immediately forgave David when Nathan the prophet pointed out his sin publicly, God immediately forgave him. There were still consequences. David's own son, Absalom, led a rebellion, drove him out of the palace. I think he even took some of his maidservants and stuff filed them and it was just a horrible thing that, that happened. That was permitted to happen because that protection of God was partially removed and God said this about David. Because of your sin, you have given occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. And because he's the leader, stricter judgment. If he had just been you know, a commander in an army or, or if he had just been an individual, there would have been consequences not nearly as severe. 
So God's very serious in this thing. And that's why I believe that Matthew 25 is the separate judgment specifically for leaders. Where the Bible says there will be a stricter judgment. And it's described as the dividing of the sheep and the goats. But if you look at what it says, these goats are being cast away. Had the Word of God. Had the living water. Had the, the garments of salvation. And they didn't speak the truth to people in charity. So that's a that's another uh, direction, uh, uh, story to pursue. So Rick, my point was that Asa was in Theta in a whole different way. <laughs> uh, walk out the of that you know, I, I just I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I should have known there was a joke there somewhere. I I, lost the <laughs> I should have known I had to take it that seriously. <laughs> All right. What about in Ephesians? Let's read in Ephesians. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, his friends there. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. By the way, that's what he considered his relationship. God gives us freedom. He says, I'm a bond servant. I was offered my freedom. I said, no, Lord, I want to stay serving you. So he considered himself a prisoner, a captive of the Lord. <clears throat> He said, I entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. See, I, I know that many of us have been taught in church that we're just filthy old dirty rotten sinners. We can never amount to anything. And, uh, you know, isn't it great that God's going to snatch us up to heaven and make us perfect someday? Let me tell you, that's not the teaching in the Word of God. The teaching in the Word of God is that we're going to do battle with our fleshly nature and with the enemy down here. And that God's people are overcomers. And that's why He's calling us to walk in a manner that's worthy of it. And, uh, and He goes on, He says, with all humility and with gentleness. And you'll recognize these are some of the qualities of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They're not listed in the same manner, those nine qualities of Galatians 5 that we're going to maybe get to tonight. But, but they're talking about those same qualities. Humility and gentleness and patience. Showing forbearance to one another in love. You know, uh, I have to quote you, Heather, pretty regularly. People, they're the worst! <laughs> and sometimes they are! Yeah. But that's why we're, we're admonished to be forbearing one to another in love. And see, you know, the Scripture says that love covers a multitude of sins. And really what that's talking about is loving people in spite of their flaws. Until the, the work of the Holy Spirit, if they're walking with God, He overcomes that, isn't it? And verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That doesn't mean that we all see everything the same way. Um, and, and Ephesians gets to that in just a moment here when he talks about the, the four craftsmen and what they do. But uh, the bond, uh, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In Him we live and move and have our being. Some of you saw the video that we showed uh, last year or the year before about a, a part of the human uh, anatomy uh, that's referred to as the rebar of the human body. It's called laminin. And laminin, if you look at it under the uh, electron microscope, it is a perfect cross. It, in its cell structure, in every cell in your body, God has put Himself. He's put the cross in every cell in your body. And uh, by the way, in the center of uh, one of the black holes, and that was on that same video, the, uh, the Hubble telescope, because it's outside the atmosphere, just is bringing back phenomenal photographs. No generation has ever witnessed the things we can see. And in the center of a black hole, they see a bright light in one of them. And it's a perfect cross. <laughs> God has put His message and Himself in uh, Rick, that, that, every cell of the body. On YouTube, if anybody wants to go watch it, and just type in you on YouTube, just type in laminin. Laminin. I, I, I can't remember the exact name, but it'll come up, and it's amazing to watch that video. Yeah. It's a. It was a. Uh, it was a traveling program that they did called "How Great Is Our God," and they used that that song as a theme. It's really, it's really awesome. And the video we showed is about an hour and a half. 
with, uh, with uh, Giglio, yeah, with Lou Giglio, who was sharing about that. And by the way, he learned about it. He's talking about God being present and everything. And, and the guy was a, was a bio uh, uh, chemist, and he, he said, oh, you need to tell him about lamin. You know, uh, and uh, so uh, anyway, it's really, it's, really, uh, it's really awesome. God has put himself in everything around us. In him, the Bible says, we live and move and have our being. Yes, sir? Some confusion about how to spell that meant. Oh, okay. Lynn? All right, Lynn, Lynn's our resident uh, spelling bee. Uh, uh, L-A-M-I-N. I-N. I-N. Oh, you don't have your phone? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. That's right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and Louis Giglio. I and you can put it in his I name, too. Louis Giglio. Yeah. Lemon and Just put L-O-U on it. It'll probably pop right up. So, so what he's saying, is that God's in and through and everything, in Him we live and move and have our being. He literally holds our bodies together. That's why when people cynically and sarcastically say, oh, you know, I want to go to hell, not heaven, because all my friends are going to be in hell. Well, I've got news for you. You don't understand God's garbage dump. No human being that you have ever met has lived in the place where there was a complete absence of God, complete darkness. And that's what hell's going to be. It's, it's a place of darkness. Now, I know that uh, one of the words for hell is Gehenna, which was the garbage dump, the Valley of Gehenna, on the west side of the temple area, is uh, the city dump. And it says, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Well, some of us are old enough to remember the fun times we used to have going with Dad to the dump. <laughs> when you went to the dump, there was always a fire and things were smolting, but there were also maggots and there was some pretty gross things, but we'd go down there and chew the, chew the rats and stuff. At the, at the city dump and also find some fun stuff sometimes. <laughs> Not as nice and clean as road finds are, but you know. <laughs> yes, sir, Dave? A problem has bothered me for a very long time. I grew up in the Seventh day Adventist Church. <clears throat> yeah. They, uh, they were so strong on the law, the love got put right back on the back burners and almost off the stove. Yeah. They talk about law and punishments, that sort of thing, so much. And, and they talk about law so infrequently that I finally realize their mistake. Um, there is judgment. There's judgment in this world. But it seems to me that there's an ultimate judge, judgment by the, the judge, who has the final say. That's correct. Um, now, now I can remember my point here. Um, as to this punishment, for one lifetime of the worst sins possible by Hitler, why is it necessary for God to punish that person without end? I, I don't, I don't understand the logic there. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. That's troubling to us with our human perspective uh, about life and about and about the world. Um, and uh, and I don't have an answer for you about that. I don't. Uh, <laughs> rats. Not an attack on that one. But see, every year, yeah, right. I had my life destroyed by people. <laughs> right. I had no respect for you. Right. Right. The, 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 I know that your life has been destroyed by federal bureaucracy. I've known several people. In fact, where Saguaro National Park is, all that property, uh, a fellow who was in our church in Colorado, that was his inheritance. And the government came in and took it away from his family way back in the 30s or something like that. And uh, he's living in a little single wide trailer on a lot in Colorado. And, and uh, so our government has done things like that in the name of good. Um, but um, I mentioned that only for equity is important. Yeah. If it's important to me, then it's important to the good Lord. Right. And, and see, here's the, here's the thing we have to keep in, keep in mind. Uh, our sense of, of judgment and right and wrong is on a whole different lower scale than, than God. Uh, you know, it seems pretty harsh that Moses didn't get to enter the promised land because he disobeyed God. 
But see, there's a whole other picture of what's going on there. Moses was the messenger of the law. Okay, and the Seventh-day Adventists and uh, some of the branches of the Church of God were very enamored of everything related to uh, the law. And Paul comes along and says, the blood of bull and goats and, and all of the things of the law never brought any life. All it did was it became our teacher to make us aware of our sinfulness so that we'd repent and, and turn to God. And, uh, and yet there are people that still think they're going to achieve some special standing uh, by fulfilling everything, everything that's in the law. Now there's a distinction between the Ten Commandments and the law because the Ten Commandments is the basic guide that God has for morality for us here, here in this world. But the, the, the thing that, that we have to grasp is this. The Bible says hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. Satan and his angels. But that's their judgment for rebelling against God and wanting to usurp his position. Uh, and uh, you can go back and read Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah 14 particularly actually tells you what was going on in Satan's mind about that. And what they're doing and the battle that we're in here is they want to steal the Word of God from us that brings us life and implants the life of God to take control over us. They want to steal that away and drag us into the outer darkness with Him. Here's the thing that I know. On the judgment day when we stand before the Lord God Almighty, the Bible says that even every idle word we're going to render account for. And now that we understand that the powers of darkness don't have a body of their own, unlike the good angels, the angels faithful to serve God. They have their own body. We're, we've been studying about that on Sundays over at Queen Valley. They have their own name. They have their own body. Um, and God allows them to, uh, for us to, to be in the realm that we can see. The powers of darkness don't. The only way they can say what they want to say is to get a human being to allow them to speak through them. And that makes more sense to me why every idle word that we speak we're going to render account for it. But here's the thing, Dave. On the judgment day, nobody's going to complain to God and say, it's not fair. <laughs> nobody's going to be saying it. Everybody is going to, on that day, all dishonesty is going to be stripped away and the truth is going to come out and every human being is going to answer for what they know. The Bible says every knee is going to bow. That's right. And they won't be because of the sword. They're going to choose to do that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, sir, Norm? Uh, I thought about something else, too. Your life says hell, mm -hmm. and Marx is itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just it just enlarges itself. Yeah, it gets bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. It's a wide road. The part I love is the part yeah. where the Lord actually stands in for us, and those of us who are in Him, right. we don't have to worry about that. That's right. And see, the question is, receiving that grace, the influence of God, as well as His mercy, which is what... Mercy is what how most people define grace. Grace is not undeserved favor. That's mercy. Grace is God's influence. It transforms us. So it comes back to this thing where Paul's exhorting people to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Look what God's done for us. Should we not be compelled to try to press on into that place that He wants us to be. Look, in verse 7, He says, To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, as it says, you know, He ascended on high, led captive a host of captives, and gave gifts to men. And uh, He explains about the ascending, descending. We just kind of skimmed over that last week. Verse 11, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastor-teachers. And I shared my opinion. I think this is the; these are the four craftsmen that are talked about in uh, the other scripture that we have there for you in Zephaniah. Uh, Zechariah. No, it is Zechariah. Yeah. Uh, these four craftsmen come to destroy the horns, the strength of the enemy. And here's what they're doing: the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, for the equipping of the saints. So that we all become effective servants of the Lord, using our own gifts and talents and abilities and time and personality to represent Jesus to the world. 
from the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until. So there comes a time we won't need apostles, prophets. Prophecy is my job, one of them that God's called me to. Evangelists, I do that sometimes. Norms, and we've got the gift of evangelism. And um, it says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Which means that, as he's already said, that we would be united, but we're going to be divergent in our opinions about things. And we need to have respect and regard for one another's opinions because until we come to that place in the unity of faith where we don't need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, that means there are going to be divergent opinions. Isn't that cool? God gives us freedom and liberty in there. We just need to recognize Jesus Christ as the Word of God. This book is the record of the Word of God. And we're going to we're going to continue to seek for truth from, from the Scripture. Uh, until we attain, verse 13, the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature uh, man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's what we're called to. That's why Paul was just confirming what Jesus said, which is, if you believe in me, the works I'm doing, you're going to do. Wow. Wow. <laughs> How many, how many times have you heard that preached in church? If you're really a believer, oh, you thought it was coming forward, receiving Jesus, praying, baptized, speaking in tongues, do it, praying for the sick and they get well going. No, 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 no. Here's the proof of you believe it. Are you doing the works of Jesus? Because that's, 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 that's the standard. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 5, 1 sums it all up in a nutshell. It says, Be imitators of God. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loves you and gave himself up for us and offered and a sacrifice to God as a fragrance alone. Amen. You're stealing my thunder, brother. <laughs> We're skipping ahead. We're skipping ahead. No, that's good. And, that's, and that really is what he's leading up to with this. Uh, this unity of the faith and the full and, and verse 14 will no longer be children tossed here and there by waves of doctrine and the trickery of men. Isn't that interesting that back in those days that there were false teachers that that had these tricky doctrines that they had that people thought was really true? Well, aren't you glad we live today? We don't have the problem like Paul did back then. Golly, they had guys that were that were being tricky and crafty and deceitful scheming. They didn't speak the truth, see verse 15, but speaking the truth in love were to grow up in all aspects in the end which they had in Christ. From the home, the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. That means every one of you need to be functioning, doing your part in the body of Christ. You need to know what it is and you need to put it into practice. And, uh, you know, we recently have done a study about the gifts, there are 19 specific gifts of the Holy Spirit enumerated in the Scripture. I believe there are probably more than that, but there are at least 19. And every one of us are given those gifts. And the question is, are you asking God through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to work that gift in you for the benefit of the body? It's the building up of the body in love. In verse 17, this I say therefore and firm together with the Lord, walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. You see, here's the fruit bearing that proves where we are. The Gentiles walk what? In the futility of their mind. Well, my opinion is, well, you know, I used to have a pretty high opinion of my opinions. <laughs> and then I found out that a lot of my opinions didn't agree with the Scripture. Gone. God, I was wrong. You were right. And I pointed out one of those in Luke chapter 8. Where I used to say, well, uh, the, you know, the people that fall away, they never really believe. You know, because I was protecting this Baptist tradition I was raised in. And then I'm reading Jesus who said, they believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. And I went, oops. Lord, I repent. I was wrong. You're right. So, uh, the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And it's amazing to me in in such a cavalier manner that Christian people call themselves Christians just cast aside the scriptures. I read a scripture to them and they're like, ah, oh, no, nah, nah, nah. Really? Oh, okay. You think you know more than, than the record of the eternal word of God that was spoken and preserved down through the generation? Well, well, good luck with that stance. And see, that's what the world is in the futility of their mind. 
well, this is just what I think, and this is, and actually mostly in America, it's, this is how I feel. And God, you know, it's really important to God how you feel. He wants you to feel good about yourself. God wants you to repent. And that's why His messengers have always been hated. Because they speak God's truth, and our fleshly mind doesn't like that. It hurts our self-esteem. You, know you know where that self-esteem crap came from? It came from the enemy. Now, let me tell you, every truth in God's Word is right here. And there are ditches on both sides that you can fall into. We have an entire generation that has been raised up in this ditch. You know, they got to have a trophy because they got up and put their pants on and went to school. Right. And they put on the baseball uniform. they got to have a trophy, you know. And, uh, oh my goodness, I don't want to help, help, you know, hurt their self-esteem. And they're so full of themselves now that they turned into what are, you know, I think uh, correctly referred to as snowflakes. Well, they can't even stand somebody mentioning <laughs> something that, that uh, you know, doesn't fit in because, you know, it could, you know, their whole life they've been protected and they've become these little monsters. So you got that ditch, now you got the other ditch, okay? Understand, there's a problem on the other side too. But people who think they're absolutely no value at all. And you know, I'm just a dirty old filthy rotten sinner. I'll never be any good. And you know, my life has no purpose. See, that's not a biblical principle either. We need to be willing to receive the mercy and forgiveness of God, which gives us great value in the purposes of God. Every one of us. We all have a part. In fact, the Bible says God gives the greater gifts to the less honored members. The ones that are kind of annoying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were all looking at me saying, there you go. <laughs> See, the people that I know that have the office gift of healing, that operate in healing all the time, and, and gosh, I, I can't think. With the case of these two women that I know, uh, you know, one in Arizona, one in Colorado, they had to get. I can't remember an occasion when the person didn't get instantly healed. And you know what? They would never raise their hand and speak out. They would never pray out loud. They, they're the less honored members. They're very quiet kind of back there. And then we find out they have this great gift of healing. And we're like, come over here. And they're like, me? me? Yes, you. You've got this gift. And the one lady, she's praying. And she's so full of the Holy Spirit. She can barely stand up. You know, and people. It's awesome. But those are people that normally you wouldn't even notice. They're in the background, and yet God gives the greatest gift uh, to them. And that's awesome. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. And the center of the problem in verse 18, it's because of the hardness of their heart. We have that in America. Hardness of heart. It's an intellectual, trained, willful hardening not just an ignorance. Now, there are exceptions, but on the whole, my, my perspective is that's what we're dealing with. Dealing with people that have hardness of heart is a different kind of challenge than people who are simply uh, unknowing or ignorant of, of the things of God. But God's called some of us to go bang hands with these people and try to help them to come to Jesus. And in verse uh, 19, he says, and they having become callous, because of the callousness of their hearts, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. And that's what we have in America today. But he says, but you didn't learn Christ in this way. And listen to what he says to his friends at the church in Ephesus. You didn't learn Christ in this way if indeed you've heard Him and have been taught in Him just as truth is in Jesus. It's amazing to me how all the the letters in the scripture. Nobody ever pats him on the cheek and says, oh, don't you worry about your salvation. I heard you pray the prayer. I, I saw you get baptized. You're going to go right up to, oh, you're such a good person. You're going to go right up. That's not in the Bible. Paul has always put a question mark over their walk with God. He's saying, go out and prove yourself. In fact, Jesus said to his own disciples, prove yourselves to be my disciples. And part of the way we do that is by remaining in his word, which reading the scripture helps us to do that. But it has to be more than our head. It has to be from our heart, seeking out to God. And so he says, if indeed you've even learned it. And verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, 
Then you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the sea. And then you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? Set your mind on the things of God. Set your mind on the flesh it's dead. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit, loving your neighbor, being kind to him, uh, you know, being in tune with the Lord daily as you move through your life, seeing what is God going to have you do, and uh, how is He going to have you share or speak to someone, or you know, uh, what circumstances He putting in your pathway that you that you have the opportunity to to demonstrate Jesus to someone, but you. Uh, you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And in verse 24, you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Does that sound like we're we're all just a bunch of you know uh, failures and dirty old filthy rags and all that we do? No, 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 no. See, the reason the prophet said there's none righteous, no, not one, is because there should have been some people who are righteous, and he was rebuking them for that. But yes, we all like sheep have gone astray and we've all failed. We need to recognize that, but we repent, get out of that pitch, and get on the pathway of allowing Jesus and His Word to get implanted in our hearts and bear the fruit of Jesus, the conduct of Jesus in our life. It's Isaiah 28. Let's go to Isaiah 28. This, this really comes right back to the enemy stealing the Word out of our hearts, and he can do that when our hearts are hardened. When we're not humble enough to say, God, I need to learn something from you. This is a very powerful passage of Scripture that is not on the list. Uh, it's not specifically in this subject matter, but it, it pertains. Isaiah 28, 9. To whom would he teach knowledge? Now, this is Isaiah asking this question of people that claim to be God's people. And to whom, that's Isaiah 28, the ninth verse, to whom would he interpret the message? So these are, he's like, okay, who's God going to give the real truth to? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? He says, is it, is it immature people? Is it, is it people just now, uh, you know, that are, that are babes in the Lord? For he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, He will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here's, here's the message God had for His people. Still, they the message God has for His people today. Here's His message. Here is rest. I'm offering you rest and peace and comfort, salvation, forgiveness and healing. Here is rest. Give rest to the weary. Here is repose. Listen. But they would not listen. Why wouldn't they listen? Oh, it's not enough to humble yourself before God and ask His forgiveness. You've got to get up and run to this meeting and celebrate that feast and follow this law and see this rule and oh my goodness, make sure you do stuff on Friday before sundown because God will really be offended if you go out there and do any, any labor on the Sabbath. Yes. Is that the eye of the needle riches? I think it is. You know, it's easier for the, the camel, you're talking about, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to, to enter into heaven. And, and who's a rich man? It's not talking about the bank account. It's talking about somebody with their own ego who, you know, oh gosh, you know, we don't want to hurt their self-esteem. Uh, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm going to stand before God and duke it out with Him. Well, you know, let me tell you what. Yeah. So, so he says, the message God has is simple. Here's rest. Here's repose. Repent. I'll forgive you. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Walk in my ways. But listen. But he says that they would not listen. They refused. They, they wouldn't listen. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's, <laughs> to me, it's kind of like, <laughs> well, I guess it was a wedding ceremony recently. <laughs> Somebody was <laughs> asking some people that came over to Queen Valley the wedding ceremony, oh, what did you think of our pastor? And they said, well, he's not very dignified. <laughs> Cha -ching. And I go, Amen. 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 See, what you know what they were saying is, now this this can't be of God. He's just a normal guy. I like the guy that's got the dignified robe. 
that can say, God. <laughs> we must bow before God. He doesn't, that's right, don't have enough initials. Yep, exactly. That's so look, that, that's it. <laughs> they, they wouldn't listen. So listen to what happens, Dave. Well, what you just said will seem to support what I'm saying or thinking. Uh, they were mind they were, Yes. They were right. all mind though. Right. Intellectual. Right. Yeah. Intellectual, yeah. yeah. No heart. And nothing in the heart. See, and then that's exactly the distinction that was made in the teaching of Jesus compared to the teaching of the Pharisees. And you remember one of the places they said, what is this new teaching that comes with power not like the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees taught facts and history and knowledge. Jesus talked to the heart. And Dave, you're exactly right. That's the distinction is somebody says that 18 inches is going to send a lot of people to hell. Yes, Jesse, Dan? I have a real simple way of putting that. They're all educated idiots. <laughs> well, Professing to be wise, they became fools, the scripture yeah. says. Yeah. So you, and, and uh, you know, and there are times that, that uh, I've had some folks that are kind of like, well, this is a waste of time. I didn't get anything to file away. You didn't talk about the history and the background and the years and the archaeology of this stuff. You're always talking about repenting, walking with God, loving your neighbor. Where is this other important information? You see, that's, that's what Christianity is for a lot of folks. And by the way, that's what this verse talks about. Don't miss this. Here it is. Are you ready? So the word of the Lord to them. See, they refused to come the way God says. So the word of the Lord to them will be, verse 13, order on order, order on order, line on line. King James says precept on precept, a little here, a little there. Watch this. That they may go and stumble backward, be broken, snared, and taken captive. Captive by whom? The enemy, because he's stolen the word of God, because they wouldn't come to God on his terms. I, I always I just marvel at this, especially the line on line, precept on precept, because there's a ministry out there called Precept Ministries, based on this scripture, as though it were a good thing. Do you see that when you get the Word of God line on line, precept on precept, you're blinded and dark and you fall away from God because the Word of God becomes, Dave, something for you to tuck away in your mind. And the Word of God is aimed at the heart. And it's the soil of the heart penetrated by the seed of the Word as it's taken in and moistened by the Holy Spirit. Boom! It gives us regeneration and new life and the new birth. And it will never happen when you're getting the Word of God line on line, precept on precept. It's amazing to me. I actually had a woman who came to me and she was pretty upset. She said, well, I've been to that precept ministries. And man, it's a really good thing that they're doing. They really teach a lot of facts and important stuff. I'm sure that they do. So did these people. And they went to hell. They had no relationship with God. But oh my goodness, they're such nice people. And aren't you glad that they passed all of these certificates and learned all of this stuff? They didn't learn the thing. Because the thing is, repent, turn to God, and guess what? He'll transform your heart. He'll teach you to love the unlovable. He'll teach you to forgive those who murdered family members. He will teach you to bless those who curse you. He will empower you to do good to your enemies. He'll transform your life. But you won't get that from line on line, precept on precept, or from the law. The law is important, however, because the law is our teacher. To bring us to the place of consciousness of sin, so we'll repent. And the American churches all want to throw the law away and says it doesn't have any purpose anymore. All the law is all passed away. Well, apparently the Bible doesn't know that, and Jesus didn't know that. Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, Don't even think that I came to destroy the law. I didn't. The law still needs to do its purpose, which is to make us aware of our failings. So we'll repent, turn to God. But when you steal that away, that's why the American church is filled with exactly the same kind of sin that's in the world. Yes. Because the teacher, the law, has been pushed away. Okay. It's more than what you bargained for. <laughs> 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 All right. 
not hospital, but one of the doctor's office, offices. And she knew a lot about the word, but she didn't know a thing about her heart. No. She, yeah. She didn't. Exactly. She couldn't catch and it. See, this is where most American Christianity is. They know some facts, and usually those are a little distorted. But when you get to know Jesus, it permeates your whole life. Verse 25, Ephesians 4, we're reading. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one with his neighbor. We're members of one another. Then he presses on, he says this in verse 26, Be angry and yet don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. And, don't miss this, do not give the devil an opportunity. See, the thief, part of what he wants us to do is give ourselves over to anger. And if we don't deal with it before the day is over, then the enemy has the opportunity to come in and begin to build a stronghold. So having anger is not the problem. The problem is allowing it to control you and allowing it to fester. And then it becomes uh, resentment and unforgiveness and ultimately uh, disdain. And uh, even it can morph itself into murder. Uh, Michael uh, found, a, uh, found a good verse for us related to this subject about the mind and the heart. And uh, he's, he found an interesting uh, what is it, a Berean translation, Michael? Yeah, it's one of the more direct word-to-word -word translations. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, which also we speak, not in words taught of human wisdom, but in those taught of the Spirit, communicating spiritual things by spiritual means. Wow. Yeah. And in other translations, it, it says spiritual words. Words. But, Means can be very different things. Yeah. So. And that's First Corinthians two. Is where that. that two thirteen. Yeah. Two thirteen. That's where that comes from. So it's it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what the people saw. They saw the transformative power of what he was teaching, because it was the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. Now our minds can benefit from it too. But getting all this history and facts and everything don't change people's heart. Yes, sir. Uh, Kelly? I uh, just need some clarity. So, in the, at the beginning of verse 1, it says he is talking to the saints at Ephesus. Right. So is that still who he's talking yep, to? Yeah, he's still talking to them. Okay, so he believes, verse 27, that believers... Can have the devil working in them. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Very good. Very good. Uh, again, that's just reinforcing this thing we've been seeing as the enemy wanting to be a manifestation in us. And many of us have been taught that, oh, once you believe in Jesus, then Satan can't be there, cannot trouble you. And yet Paul was concerned that the devil would get into and take hold of the lives of some of these people who were friends of his. Uh, by the way, you know we've done a we've done a whole study about that, so we can't pursue that uh, tonight. But we looked at the Syrophoenician woman, wanted the demon cast out of her daughter, and Jesus said, "This is the children's bread. I do this for my children. Get them free of the enemy." Uh, yes, so Jerry. Well, that whole thing in the this theme is repeated over and over in the New Testament about the fiery darts of Satan, the yep. fire, and we're using the armor of God. I mean, obviously, he's not going to quit. He's going to keep attacking us. Right. And I honestly believe that if you're a new Christian or your kids are just about to uh, get into a new youth group and they're, mm -hmm. they're going to go forward or whatever, I think Satan attacks harder yep. on, on most people than he yeah. does on the ones that you know aren't... See, that's, that's where he tries to come and kill the Word. Remember, yeah. first... If your heart's hardened, he comes and steals the word out of your heart so you don't even believe. But when you choose to believe, then he really cranks the heat up, if you will, and wants to kill what growth there is there. And, and he so, keeps on your whole life. I mean, and he does, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in fact, Ephesians 6 is where he, and we aren't going to get there tonight, we'll probably get there next week, but in Ephesians 6 is where he talks about putting on the armor to stand against the enemy because he. He's not worried about 
about the atheists and the agnostics and the prostitutes. He's already got them. He's concerned about people choosing to walk with God. And that's why his big attack is there. Yes, Stephanie? It, it says after the uh, Jesus was in the wilderness and he had the temptations, it said, and Satan withdrew for a more expedient time. Right, right. Even with Jesus, Satan was done. He circles back around. So... Uh, that's that's exactly right. So don't give the devil an opportunity. What? To establish a stronghold in you. And he can do that if you hold on to this thing of anger. And and uh, so he's talking about that importance of the good fruit. Verse 28, let him who steals, steal no longer. But rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what's good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. And let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Why? Because you're giving the devil an opportunity to speak his vitriol through you at someone else. Satan hates human beings. That's why uh, when America has turned its back on the truths of God, then America has no problem at all slaughtering innocent citizens. And, uh, you know, potential taxpayers, since they always talk about how important it is that, you know, everybody make a contribution. They have no compunction about that because the enemy hates human beings and wants them destroyed. This is the third major time where babies have been attacked. Mm -hmm. yep. The first was in Egypt when all of the, the male children were to be thrown in the Nile, and that's where Moses was, he was thrown in the Nile, but he was put in a little ark, a little boat. And, of course, he was just a lucky one. <laughs> he was a lucky one that Pharaoh's daughter grabs him. And the second time was when Herod tried to slaughter the, the males again to try to prevent the coming of the king of the Jews. And Joseph was warned in a vision by an angel to go down to Egypt, and he did just that. And all of these children, two years old and younger, were slaughtered, the little boys. And now, once again, uh, probably the worst in human history, the destruction. One of the black leaders recently pointed out to the black community, he said, every nine months in America, we kill more people than were killed all the hundred some years of the existence of the Ku Klux Klan. He said, every nine months, we kill that many of our own people. And we're, we still want to talk about the KKK, and we don't talk about what's going on now. I think it's in Freakonomics, they said in 2013, more black babies were aborted than born in New York City. Yeah, geez. In 2013, more black babies aborted than were born. Wow. 70%. And by the way, uh, for the benefit of those of you that haven't been paying attention, uh, the lady who's credited with founding the feminist movement and uh, and uh, uh, what's the Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Yeah. If you haven't, what's her name? Sanger. Yeah. Margaret Sanger. Yeah. There's actually a video that someone caught that I can't believe got out for a little while and then it disappeared where she said, we've got to get rid of all these dark-skinned people. Yeah, that's what she started with. That's and she's the founder of Planned Parenthood. And, and of course, see, see how... You, See how ignorant and foolish people are if they don't check into the history. And of course, who's driving this? The powers of darkness. Satan hates human beings. He wants to... And of course, he's fighting a delaying game. The hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. And anybody they can drag there with them. But you realize what he's doing is he's trying to delay the returning the ultimate final judgment that's going to come on him by killing human beings and keeping... Them from having a chance to come to know Jesus. Well, Road versus Way, the lady that. Yeah. You know, she supposedly wanted the right. abortion. She came out, what, about 10 years ago and said mm -hmm. she never wanted it. She she they were crushing her. Yeah. She Other people yeah. that had that have the agenda. So, exactly. and if you want to know more about that, uh, there, you know, you can go and do it. You don't have to dig very far to find the truth. Exactly. But you're not going to hear it on the evening news and the alphabet with all of their propaganda, the alphabet news. That's why I think it was about 93 that I turned all that off and haven't listened to it since. Mm -hmm. To show them all again, the movie God's Nail. It's coming out the 12th. Yeah. What's it called? God's, God's Nail. That's an uh, abortionist in uh, Philadelphia. Wow. 
Yeah. Yeah. What's it called? God's male. Yeah. And the after God is the last name is Cain. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know what's you know what's really you know what's really amazing is uh, the uh, can the the organization that does the cancer awareness, pink ribbon and all that. What's that group? What what's the name of the 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 Susan B. Anthony, right, right, the, uh, um, colon, colon, right, 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 about the uh, breast cancer awareness and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that the head got fired because she said we're not going to fund uh, Planned Parenthood anymore? Yes. Because their main business is abortions, mm -hmm. and women who have abortions are something like, what, seven or eight times more susceptible to breast cancer? Yeah. Uh, and see that information's out there, and immediately she swished off the stage yeah, and uh, and driven away. So uh, nobody anyway. wants to talk about it's, this stuff. No, no, but yeah. but let me tell you, it's folks. This world is controlled by Satan and the powers of darkness. Oh, yes. And if the world's for it, mark it down. It's not from God. Yeah. And by the way, the churches get in league with this and and are following right along. Yes, ma'am. You know, the scripture talks about a million man army. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to come from a country that said you could only have two children. Mm -hmm. and, and for generations, they have been killing the baby girls. Mm -hmm. right. yep. and now they have all of these right. men and not enough women for wives right. and mothers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And another thing. I used to direct the crisis pregnancy center, so I know a lot of things that happen that other people don't know. But uh, Hillary Clinton and her husband were used to open the doors wide in the White House. That, that's how the abortion took off like it did. It was that she, she had... Yeah, she was definitely yeah. in, in league and all that. And by the way, do you know where the... Uh, corruption, if you, if you know anything about our history, you know where the corruptive influences came into her as a young woman? Through youth magazines at her church, and I can't remember if it was Presbyterian or Methodist, Methodist. from the 60s. Was it Methodist? Thank you. Methodist church. And they started introducing all of this ungodly stuff, and that's where she got intoxicated with that. So, let me tell you, when Revelation talks about judgment coming on the churches, mm -hmm. and when, when God exposes them and destroys the churches, it says that the merchants of the earth are all going to be wailing because they are in agreement, not the real church of God, but the churches of men. And guess who's controlling that? The powers of darkness. Yes, Ruth? Well, I would like to say this too. Everybody, most of us saw the news all these last weeks. Christians better be out there voting. Yes, yeah. because we we have a country founded on God, and it's just about been taken away from yeah. us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we don't stand up, yeah. I think we're, I think God intends yeah. us to stand up. Well, I think I at think least the, to vote. Yeah. yeah, Amen. So, folks, we have to realize that that our enemy are actually not those broadcasters and the politicians. Our enemy is spiritual enemy. Absolutely. And, and they're behind these people are pawns. Many of them nice people. They have no idea how deluded and deceived they are. And that's why we need to realize we're all susceptible to deception. And and there are so many others that are that are so far beyond what most of us in this room tonight can understand. But and you can and you can just you know, you spend the rest of your life pursuing information about all the stuff that's going on. But what we really need to focus on, let's don't lose our, our focus, is that we need to learn how to walk in tune with God and live in the kingdom of God right here and right now and just be aware that all this stuff's going on. Yes, sir, Chuck? Well, I agree with very good point. If not only did you talk about voting, but I got news for you. When I was on the council for about 12 years, and we had uh, something was coming up like you take like uh, somebody want a liquor license right by this by a uh, uh, right by where the school put kids up, you know, right there. 
So I went out all the time, different area in the community, and tried to get back and to stop it. From the churches. You know how far it got? Yeah. No, no, no. And then we tried. It was. It wanted. Now, now some of this wouldn't work now, but back then it would. This guy wanted to put in one of those adult things, you know, and they want, you know, and he came to get his life, and and uh, we we could. I tried to get churches to come. Do you think you could get anybody to come back you on that? I mean, I'm not talking about just voting. Right. Now. Right. I'm about somebody to back you in your community right there. Right they there. don't do it. Yeah. And what we did. The only way we could get it, you couldn't do it now. We 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 said we had to say yes by law. Yeah. But on the other hand, we had was able to put a tax and that you know self no. daily. So we <laughs> never open it. But you can't do that. My point is no. right what you're saying. No. We're Nobody's standing up to back you. Right. That's the point. just back. Well, and that's, and that's back. part of the reason that, that we're, we're in the mess, our nation's in the mess that it's in right now. I mean, we're not about just a, I'm not about a small community. I'm not even talking about the whole country. Right. I mean, right here, you know, they yeah. still won't stand up and help you. Yeah. They a, just won't do it. At the town council in Florence, they, they quit having prayer at the beginning because they couldn't get pastors to come and lead in prayer. Anybody can come and lead in prayer before the council meeting. Yeah, so they don't have council meetings in the prayer of the council meeting anymore. So, so folks, listen, you know, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they just dispense with that as a part of it. So folks, look, the enemy's at work, and we need to have our eyes and ears open and not be na naive. And, and realize the enemy is scheming. But verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as the word is good as for edification, according to the need of the moment that may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How can we grieve it? By allowing the powers of darkness to speak right through our vocal cords and and to do things, uh, deeds that we're complicit with, uh, complicit with in our lives. And so he says uh, in verse 31, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, be put away from you along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, because we're going to step on each other's toes, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And as our brother Dave read to us earlier, therefore, verse 1, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And do not let or immorality or impurity or greed even be named among you. See again, this is how the enemy comes in to steal our relationship with God and to steal the Word of God by getting us to give ourselves over to these ungodly things. Uh, even be named among you as is proper among saints, and there must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the given of thanks. For you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But wait a minute, what if he joined our church and put a bunch of money in the offering plate? So listen, he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Empty words. But what? But he's a nice guy. Oh gosh, you know, I, you know, he, he built us a building. He, he gave a bunch of money for missions. Don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, what things? The ungodly deeds toward your fellow men. Because of the, these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness. That's where we were living. But now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord.